Enough with the nonsense. It's time for every individual in the wide and vast non-feminist majority to go full force after the feminists. And I'm here to bring a few ways on how to do that effectively. Let's explore. Hello everyone, and welcome to the Freedom Alternative. Okay, so this is a follow-up to this video, 5 Practical Ways to Deal with Social Justice Warriors. I suggest you watch that one as well, because it provides the complementing perspective to this one. Now, as I said in that video, fe whilst all social justice warriors are indeed feminists, not all feminists are social justice warriors. Indeed, many feminists are a lot worse than SJWs. You see, the SJW is merely the useful idiot of the ideologues who control the places that train the future occupiers of the corridors of power. As such, the methods to deal with the non-SJW feminists differ quite a bit. And just like the previous list, the tactics are not complementary nor mutually exclusive. Anyway, let's stop wasting time, because there's a lot to cover. The first one is common with the SJW list and indeed common to any guide meant to bring practical guidance in dealing with ideologues and control freaks. Arguing with a feminist one-on-one -on -one with no audience is quite a terrible idea, and not because you can't do it or your arguments aren't good enough, but because it's a total waste of time. Feminists are, as I said, the ideologues who create the SJWs. As a result, these people are not going to be persuaded by reason and logic. I mean, no matter how accurate your facts are, no matter how reasonable you frame your argument, the likelihood of persuading a feminist through such means is smaller than the likelihood of being struck by lightning on Friday the 13th at 1300 hours and 13 minutes in a crowd of 150,000 people. <laughs> and surely it can happen, but it's very unlikely. The audience can be anything from one person to one million persons, but what is important is that the audience is either ignorant or impartial with regards to the feminism topic. And this is very important because, you see, arguing with a feminist in the comment section of the Guardian newspaper, for instance, is also futile, since it is an overly partisan soil with bad happy moderators. Now, arguing with feminists on places like, let's say, AVFM or anti misandry or other anti-feminist spaces is a lot less likely to get you banned, but the audience is neither ignorant nor impartial. As such, the non-feminist message overall is not being forwarded. As such, it's a total waste of time. Now, as anti-feminism became a lot more popular lately, it also brought the opportunity of uh, safely using probably the best space to argue with the feminist, namely your own social media timeline. That's even better if you manage to do it on a page that is not relate related directly to sexual politics, such as the Facebook page of a police station, for instance. The purpose is to convince the audience, not just the... the not, not just that the feminist you're talking with, uh, with is insane, but that feminism itself is demented. And I'll expand on that soon. Anyway, second element on the list, don't use partisan sources. Let them do it, and then shame them for doing it. Now look, here's the thing. The non-feminist discourse can be framed without the need of appealing to links to overly, overtly anti-feminist pu publications. On the other hand, the feminist discourse cannot stand to scrutiny for more than three comments without an appeal to cancerous rags such as The Guardian, The Daily Cause, The Muffington Post, and the rest of the feminist media complex. There are, however, two exceptions for this rule. The first one is when a feminist rag proves a point that is anti-feminist by nature. And the second exception is uh, when pointing out to feminist stupidity. In these two cases, yes, please do point to partisan feminist publications. Otherwise, you should refrain yourself from doing so. And the reason for this, I think, is self-evident. An ignorant or an impartial audience will instinctively sniff that something's rotten in the Kingdom of Denmark when the supposedly 
popular side makes long and inconsistent ramblings supported by links to everyday feminism or some similar crap, whilst the supposedly evil side makes shorter, on-point comments supported by links that end in .gov or .edu and similar ones. For instance, here's a concrete example. JB has a nice article on AVFM on what would happen with the society if men would collectively take a day off. The lazy thing to do is to just drop the link. The problem, of course, is that only a tidy proportion of the audience it would be willing to click on a link that starts with a voiceforman.com. The much more complicated but also exponentially more efficient thing to do is to compile a shorter version of this article on your own using Judgey Bitch's references. The latter no longer has the stain of partisanship, unless the feminist claims that the Bureau of Labor Statistics is a partisan source, in which case you want the entire audience since that is a demented claim per se. Don't worry, you'll get those too. <laughs> I've recently had a university professor <clears throat> telling me that Eurostat is not good enough because it's a tool of old white men. Uh, that was a great day since all I had to do to humiliate my opponent in front of the audience was to just post the picture of the commissioner to which Eurostat is accountable to. But discounting these cases, which, let's face it, are quite rare, it is generally efficient to rewrite a shorter version of the argument using the original sources. In this way, you eliminate the psychological barrier of partisanship that exists in an ignorant audience. Number three. Merciless mocking and satire is mandatory. Now look, here's the deal. You should always take their argument to the extreme. Why? Well, because you can, that's why. As Fido Bogan likes to say, feminism is what we say it is. So, for instance, when a so-called moderate feminist comes up with the usual stupidity that radical feminists are about the same thing as MRAs, the right course of action is not to start explaining the differences between various sectors of the non-feminist segment of the society the likelihood is that the audience doesn't care about that, and the feminist either already knows it and is willfully uh, ignorant and willfully disingenuous, or doesn't know it and doesn't care to know it. Either way, it's a waste of time. The right course of action with such argument is mockery. When I get this, uh, it's all the same nonsense, I always retort with something like this. Yes, yes, you're absolutely correct. Remember that time when MRAs vowed to kill 90% of women? Do you remember that time when MRAs took over the parliament and voted to keep female victims of rape out from legal protection? Or maybe that time when MRAs refused to even consider women's issues in the parliament of a first world nation? Yep, that's right, MRAs are equally bad. With such a retort, you do more than one thing. For starters, you mock the feminist argument, you expose the to the ignorant audience the extent to which the feminist problem goes, and you make your interlocutor or interlocutors look completely disconnected from the realities of their own position. And these are no small things to do, especially in just one comment. Now, if you're on Facebook or some other medium that allows longer comments, you should, and you, you can and should, even post links to each of them, thus showing the obvious contradiction, and with, with that, you get to also infer to the double think that is inherent in the feminist framework of non-thinking. Again, that's a no small thing to do. It's usually quite hard to show to an ignorant audience that feminism and double think go hand in hand. That's why utterly retarded arguments should be viewed as a great opportunity by non-feminists and not as a, co as, a, as a cause to get angry. Here's another example. When debating with a non-SJW feminist, make sure to stick it to that feminist all the stupidities of Dumbler feminism, especially manspreading, pole-hogging, man-slamming, trans-nigger, thin privilege, everything, the whole nine yards. And again, feminism is what we say it is. And since, non -feminism, and since feminism is a tidy fraction of the world, and most definitely not the world, the feminist must always be compelled to be on the defensive. As such, you should ask the feminist to defend the most retarded shit that ever came out 
from the feminist circles. Number four on the list. You draw the lines and enforce them. Whenever they remain without arguments, which is almost every time if the conversation is longer than five minutes or longer than six or seven comments, feminists like to go rogue and shift the goalposts. Do not let them do that. Now, there are multiple ways to enforce this. My favorite method is, of course, mocking and satire, but it doesn't always work like that. Anyway, let's take an example. For instance, when cornered, a feminist will always try to shift the argument from, let's say, manspreading to alleged female oppression in Africa or some other claptrap. Now, whenever that happens, I usually say something like this. I'm sorry, but we don't live in Africa. Also, last time I checked, African countries were putting Marxist feminist prime ministers and boys were kidnapped and forcibly genitally mutilated, sometimes for profit. Profit for feminists. So please, don't move the goalposts. We both live in this place, so let's address this place that we can actually change for the better. There's nothing you can do, or I can do for that matter, to change the affairs in Africa. But we can change the Istanbul Convention, or VAWA, or whatever applies to your area. Now, I do realize that this tactic does require a huge amount of knowledge. Many anti-feminists are themselves quite ignorant to the extent to which the feminist cancer goes, but ignorance can be dealt with. So start reading and start accumulating knowledge. Now, I know it's a cliché, but knowledge really is power. Of course, this tactic needs to also be adjusted for your area. For instance, when I get to, to choose the area, I always choose the area in which the feminist resides. And if the feminist resides in Eastern Europe, I have the utmost fun because the facts don't support pretty much anything from the feminist narrative. At this point in time, the safest place on earth for women is Eastern Europe. Except for the tiny war area in the far east of Ukraine, of course. And when such thing occurs, whenever the feminist tries to deviate and brings in argument from the former Western bloc, I make sure to mock that mercilessly with a retort to the effect of yeah, surely we should take policy lessons from the country that rewards false rape allegations, bans paternity tests, that's France, by the way, and whose press is interested in manspreading and poll hogging. Yes, please tell me more. Surely the Polish or Hungarian women will be thrilled to be protected from the horrors of manspreading. Are you sure you even know the women in your country? So, the bottom line is, don't let the feminist lead the discussion. Enforce the boundaries as strict as possible and keep the feminist on the defensive. The feminist position is so demented that it should never be allowed to lead any discussion. Since when do fringe lunatics, who represent 2% of the world population at best, get to lead the discussion on sexual politics? Fuck you! No! You shut up and take it. And take it hard. And the final element in the list, bring up a story or humanize the problem. Now, this tactic works best if you are a non-feminist woman and the audience is mostly female of any age or men over 45. Now, I know this is triggering and sexist and whatnot, but I don't really care about that. I care about winning. And this tactic doesn't really work with young men. A significant portion of young men will not be particularly interested by a story or impressed by it unless it's very brutal. Anyway, when I say a story, I don't mean a fictional story, but a very real-life story. For example, this is Earl Silverman. Earl Silverman struggled for decades to get funding to maintain the only domestic violence shelter for battered men, but thanks to the humanist feminist in, feminists in the corridors of power, he got largely jack shit. He eventually committed suicide and now Canada has zero such shelters and delved even more into a feminist theocracy. Is that the world you want? And if it is, then at least be fucking honest. Come out and say it loud that Earl Silverman was just a white cishet privileged male who benefited from the institutionalized patriarchy, or whatever bullshit is fashionable this week in the feminist sex cesspool. The key to this tactic's success is to get the right amount of emotion, the full facts placed as succinctly as possible, 
and the right amount of mockery of the feminist position. Now, those of you out there who are a bit more versed into sexual politics already get it why I said this tactic is the most successful when a woman uses it. The short version is, that thing called the empathy gap is not a joke. When a woman complains, the society listens. When a man complains, well, the society tends to care a lot less, if at all. When a man comes with an emotionally charged story, unless it's very brutal and involves some children as well, society doesn't care at all. Now, the Earl Silverman story is just an example. There are countless stories in each country with various situations where boys or men have been severely harmed by feminist design policies and or actions. Again, the purpose is not to appeal to the humanity of the feminist. The purpose is to plant deep emotional seeds of doubt in the hearts and minds of the audience. At the end of the discussion, most of the audience will still remember the emotional story, if delivered appropriately, and it will bug them. Most of them will actually try to find out more, and some of those will stick around the anti-feminist spaces. And that's how you win hearts and minds for the politically activated non-feminist sector. So yeah. Now, mind you, nothing I said in this list is controversial. These have already been tested in the last six years and the results pretty much speak for themselves. For instance, in 2013, there were three podcasts on anti-feminism on YouTube, including mine. Now, there are so many of them that YouTube should create a special category for anti-feminism. Those didn't come about overnight. Those are the results of a relentless campaign for hearts and minds by individuals across the planet. And it keeps on growing. This year, the BBC was essentially compelled by staunch non-feminists to celebrate the International Men's Day. This was unimaginable merely two years ago. These tactics work, and the more they're applied, the closer we all get to extirpating this societal cancer that is feminism. Also, these are not the only tactics. There are a lot more in the book. And speaking about uh, uh, speaking of books, maybe I should write a book like a manual on this, because there's so much out there that has already been tested thoroughly and works almost like magic. Anyway, that's enough for now. If you have other tactics in mind, put them in the comments and let's discuss this further. And with that being said, thanks a lot for watching and um, I'll see you around on Freedom Alternative.